Appreciate it, guys. No now, folks, believe it or not, we did not hire those guys because they could play the guitar. <laughs> uh, seriously. We, if you think that was good, you ought to hear them teach. Uh, that's, that's where they're, they're even at their best there. But, uh, well, wasn't that good? I don't think, uh, uh, see if I can get hooked up here. I keep, I'm convinced I'm going to get electrocuted when those things with these things. And they tell me it can't happen. Have you ever, have you ever been in a, you know, like a Bible study or, you know, Sunday school class, small group or whatever, even a small prayer meeting where the leader came in and said, um, we're going to do something different today. And by the way, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not going to do that. I'm just t- using this illustration. The, the, the leader says, look, we're going to do something different today. Instead of me talking, I'm going to have several of you share with us your favorite Bible verse. And then tell us why it's your favorite Bible verse. You ever been with something like that? Let me, let me give you a secret here. That's what happens when the leader didn't have enough time to prepare a lesson. Okay? Uh, now, don't ask me how I know that. Okay? I'm just saying that happens. But, you know, most people in those times, they'll, they'll sort of look down. They, oh, God, don't call on me. Don't call on me. You know. But let me, let me tell you something. If, if Satan were there with you in one of those chairs, Satan would be saying, oh, oh, me, 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 call on me. I got one, I got one. You said, wait a minute. Satan would not have a favorite Bible verse. Uh, y- yes, he does. Uh, he, he really does. Uh, we'd say, share with us your Bible verse and tell me, tell us, share with us why it is that you like it so much. And the devil would share with us his favorite Bible verse. And so, if you're interested in what that is, I will call your attention to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. The very first words, it says, do not judge. The devil loves that verse. You say, wait a minute, devil, why do you love that verse? And he would say, because I get to use it all the time. I want to say he gets to misuse it all the time, but he does use it, okay? Uh, what is your favorite? And by the way, if I would ask you that, what's your favorite verse? Have you got one? I, I, I don't understand. The, the question seems to me to be truncated. You know, it's not a complete question. You know, what's your, what's your favorite color for what? Well, I mean, that's a whole different. What's your, what's your favorite color? You know, I mean, my favorite color car would probably be green, you know? Uh, I wouldn't want green hair. You know, some of you have green hair. That's okay. You know, that would not be my color of preference. But, you know, if you look at me, I would probably ought to take any color I could get right now. (laughs) But the fact is, when you say, what's your favorite color? Color for what? When you say your favorite Bible verse, your favorite one for what? I have a lot of different kind of needs. You know, a lot of people have a life verse. And look, I understand that. I'm just poking fun here, you know. But let me tell you something. If you've got a life verse, one verse, you need to get a life Okay, Uh, I do not have one verse that gets me through life. I have to have a bunch of them because I have a lot of different problems that I have to deal with myself. So, but the devil's got one. And and he would say, it's don't judge. And you say, well, why do you like that one? He said, here's why. Because by using it, I can make all Christians, I can make their righteousness appear to be self-righteous. When they stand up and say, well, something is wrong. God says it's wrong. The devil says, I've always got somebody there to say, well, now, who are you to judge? Uh, The Bible says, don't judge. And he says, then the second way that helps is Satan says, I have found out that is a conversation stopper. Because most Christians don't have a clue of how to respond to that. They're really trying to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth and stand up and say a certain thing is wrong. But as soon as somebody says, well, who are you to judge? It's like, ooh, that's a good point. <laughs> now, how am I supposed to, why am I judging? The Bible clearly says, don't judge. So it's very effective. Folks, understand, let's understand right up front that when the devil uses that, he's assuming two things. And a lot of times we end up uh, agreeing with him unintentionally. And that is that morality is really relative. You know, you can't say that what another person is doing is wrong because there's no moral absolute there. Uh, or it, it, it assumes that religion is a, is a private matter. 
Uh, folks, by the way, those are two beliefs and convictions that Jesus didn't share. He does not believe that religion is private. It's personal. Religion's personal, but it's not private. Okay? Uh, Jesus didn't share what m- many in our society share, and that is that morality is relative, and one person can't say that what another person is doing is wrong. Because usually when they do, somebody there is ready to quote the Bible. Don't judge. You know, it's interesting. And by the way, I've never done this. I, I'm a whole lot nicer in person than I come across, you know, in, in public sometimes. So I, I never, I never, but I, I have thought about it times when somebody says, don't judge. I've thought about asking them a couple of questions. Uh, is that in the Bible? Uh, where is that found? There is not a chance in the world that they could actually tell me where that was found. But they know that verse, <laughs> you know. And I've sometimes said, well, could you, let me ask them now. Uh, what other Bible verses do you know? You know? Well, not many, but I know that one, okay? Uh, and that's because Satan actually knows how to use that verse. Well, now, in look at it, folks, if, if that's Satan's favorite verse when he misuses it, I think we would do well to find out what, what should we actually think about this passage. So what I want us to do is, first of all, look at the passage and ask this question. What did Jesus not mean when he said that? What did he not mean when he said, don't judge? But then the second thing I want to do is ask this question. What did he mean? Because he really did mean something by that, and he meant it seriously. And then the third thing is to look at this passage and ask, is there, are there any incentives that Jesus actually gives us in this passage that would motivate us and encourage us to do what he is telling us to do. So that's sort of where we're headed. Now, Jesus said, judge not. Do not judge. Now, folks, I want to tell you what Jesus did not mean. And every one of you are going to say, you're the dean of of what? (laughs) You, you actually teach what? You know, you've been here 30 years, yeah, you're getting senile. It's time for you to go. <laughs> That's what you're going to be saying. But when I tell you what Jesus didn't mean, so buckle your seatbelt, okay? <laughs> when Jesus said, judge not, he did not mean judge not. <laughs> yeah. So I told you. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, judge not. Folks, Jesus does not tell us here that in all circumstances, on all occasions, whatever the situation is, you are not to judge what another person is doing or what another person has said. Folks, no, j- just reason with me a moment. If that's true, we could never say that what somebody else did was wrong because you would be told, don't judge. I had a lady call me on the phone several years ago. She said, a terrible thing just happened. My husband just walked out on us, me and our three children. And then she said, I, that's just wrong. And then she said, well, who am I to judge? I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I said, honey, you don't have to judge. Jesus already did. That, that committee's already met. That was wrong. If Jesus here means simply don't judge ever under any circumstances, folks, I, I remember, and I think, I think I was in college at that time, we had a murder in Greenville of a narcotics agent, drug agent, and he was getting ready to expose some folks that he had found that were trafficking in drugs. And the problem is some of them were on the sheriff's department force years ago. Well, this guy ends up being murdered in his place of business. And a black man was arrested and framed for this by the sheriff's office. I'm going, I'm going to tell you what, Peter, this is what everything appears to be now. And he spent over 20 years in prison for that crime that he didn't commit. I want to tell you something, folks. That was wrong. 
That was immoral. And somebody is going to pay for that. And I am not violating what Jesus said when he said, do not judge. Folks, I am judging that to be immoral. It is wrong. When we go through our society and we see the direction morally, particularly in, in, in social sexual issues, the way the society is going, Christians are often silenced by saying, who are you to judge? Don't judge, and it is a conversation stopper. Folks, if that's true, I can't look back and see and speak to the six million Jews that were slaughtered in the Holocaust. I can't look back and say why they were wrong for doing that. Because I could be asked, well, who are you to judge? Jesus said, don't judge. Friends, Jesus did not mean that it is always wrong under all circumstances to make moral judgments. As a matter of fact, you say, well, why, why, I don't understand that. That's what it says. Okay, let me, let me tell you the hermeneutical problem here. Okay, that means Bible interpretation. You see, if we're not careful, we have to make sure that we don't pick verses out of their context. Okay, take it out of its context and then seek to apply it in ways it was not intended to apply. You have to read it with other passages. In fact, the same thing happens down in verse 7. L look what he says in verse 7. Um, uh, he says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Ask, now folks, let me ask you a question. How many of you have actually prayed and asked God for something that you didn't get? How many of you have every, let me ask it this way, how many of you, everything you have prayed for is just like this, you got it? I'd like to see a hand or two because I'd like to talk to you afterward. I need you to pray for me about a couple of things that I've been working on a while. Okay. <laughs> Well, folks, that's what the Bible says. It says, ask and it'll be given to you. You say, yes, but you just picked that verse right out of its context, extracted it from it, and then you're trying to apply it to places Jesus never applied. Now, to show you even further that Jesus did not mean that it's always wrong for us in all circumstances to make moral judgments on what people are doing or not doing. Because if you look in the, right after Jesus makes this statement, look in verse 6 what Jesus says. Do not give that which is holy to the dogs. Okay. If I'm going to do that, I have to determine who these dogs are that Jesus is talking about. Who is one and who isn't. And you know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to judge who it is. I, there's no way that I can be obedient to what Jesus just told me to do right after he said don't judge. He says don't give that which is holy unto the dogs. Well, folks, I've got to make a moral judgment there. Who's it? Well, that, look at verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Well, folks, how can I be aware, beware of a false prophet if I'm not looking and listening in what they're saying and judging what they're saying to be biblical or not biblical? You have to judge those kinds of things. Jesus is telling us we have to judge those kinds of things. Look down at verse 20. By their fruits you will know them. Well, well, are their fruits good or bad? Well, I have to make a judgment and determine whether or not it's good or bad. So I can't just say Jesus is here telling us never judge what anybody is doing when he clearly gives us three examples almost in the same breath where he, we have to make judgments. That is, now, if you really want to see a clincher here, look at John chapter 7, verse 24. In fact, what you probably ought to do is in your Bible, right beside Matthew 7, 1, is to write, see also uh, John 7, 24, because here's what it says. Judge. An imperative. Judge with a righteous judgment. Judge and do it right. Well, which one did Jesus mean? Judge or not judge? He's certainly not telling us don't ever judge because in John he tells us we are to judge. But we're to judge the right way. We're to judge with a righteous judgment. So what did Jesus not mean when he said do not judge? He did not mean it is always wrong in all circumstances to make moral judgments 
in the world in which we live. He does not mean that. Now, folks, it's real easy for us to say, good, glad to know that. But whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus did mean something, and we need to be clear on what he meant, and we need to apply it to our own lives. When he said, judge not, what did he actually mean? Well, folks, the context is a said will usually help us. And so if you look at the next few verses there, right after Jesus says this in verse, uh, in verse uh, uh, 3, why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye but you don't notice the log that's in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck, little tiny speck out of your eye, when you've got a log in your own eye? You know what Jesus is warning us of here? <laughs> not judging people wrongly. Now, there are people that will quote that verse and say, see, Jesus told you not to be concerned about the speck in somebody else's eye. No, he didn't. That's not what he said. He said, get the log out of your eye first. <laughs> And then you can be concerned about the log, the, the speck in somebody else's eye. Okay? Let's, let's read carefully what Jesus said. We're supposed to be concerned about the issues in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. He didn't tell us that's none of your business. He said, you need to make sure that you're not guilty of something even worse. So that's what Jesus means. Now, we can look through the scriptures and see where the scriptures gives us many ideas, many indications of how we are not supposed to judge. Folks, obviously, we are not supposed to judge hypocritically. You know, that, that's what he was telling us in verses 3 through 5. You, you're doing the same thing or worse, and you're judging somebody else for it. Jesus is saying, don't judge that way. <laughs> okay? You still have to make judgments, you have to, but don't judge hypocritically. Folks, that's, that's actually what we see in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Remember after David's sin with Bathsheba? Responsible, has her husband basically murdered, okay? And, and he gets by with that. It, it pleased everybody except the one that it matters most. It didn't please the Lord. The scripture says that which David did displeased the Lord. And interestingly, about a year later, the prophet Nathan came knocking on David's door. David was the king. He said, David, you need to be aware of something that's happened in your kingdom. You need to do something about it. David said, what is it? He said, there's this rich man in your kingdom. He said, he's got all kinds of flocks and herds, animals. and all. He's a rich guy. And he said, living over close to him, just adjacent, there's a man with a little old small plot of land that he, that he tends. He has one animal. And in fact, it, he just, it's a little lamb. He treats it as a pet. It, it eats at the table with him, sleeps in the bed with him. He said, it's just a pet. He said, that rich man had some visitors come visit him. And instead of taking one of his flock and killing it and feeding it to his guests, he took this man's little ewe lamb and gave it to them, to, to, to his, his, his guests for them to eat. Well, folks, David flew into a rage. And he said, Nathan, this man is worthy of death. Who is it? And David Nathan pointed his finger in David's face and he said, you're the man that did it. You're the man that did it. Folks, you see what David had condemned to death, a man for killing somebody else's lamb when he had killed a woman's husband. That's what Jesus is saying don't do. Don't judge hypocritically, he says. Folks, don't judge rashly. That, that means too quickly without knowing all the facts. You know, it's an interesting passage in Genesis chapter 18. Uh, God says, I have heard the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah down there, and it sounds like it's pretty bad. I'm going to go down and check and see if it's that bad. Now, folks, we know enough about God to know he doesn't have to go down anywhere to check on a fact. You know, his point was, when I make a judgment, I know the facts. <laughs> yeah, I know the facts. And, and when we are called upon to make moral judgments, what we need to do is the best we can make sure we've got all the facts. Because sometimes we make judgments and we find out later we would like to reverse what we said because we didn't have all the facts. Now, friends, listen. If we wait until we have absolutely all the facts, we'll probably never judge anything. The fact is, sometimes we do have to judge without all the facts. And so you know what that tells us we ought to do? Always judge with humility because we might have to come back and walk that thing back a little bit. 
And that's why somebody said a long time ago, make sure whatever you say, whatever words you say, say them sweetly. You might have to come back and eat them. Okay? Because the fact is, we may never know everything, but, but we are called upon make, to make judgments. We are not to do it rashly. We're not to do it presumptuously. See, presu that, 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 that means, when I say judge in areas that we don't know. Folks, listen, the biggest example, the greatest example is somebody's motives. I can look at an action, folks, and in most cases say that was right or that was wrong. Okay? We can judge actions, but here's what we can't judge. We can't judge people's motives. In fact, that's what happened over in, in Job, the first chapter of, uh, of Job. Um, it, it says there in verse 7, the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan said, uh, uh, Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about the earth, walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered, did you see my servant Job? Man, what a great guy. Yeah. Uh, for there's no one like him on the earth. He's blameless, an upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear you for nothing? Why does he fear you? He says, Here's why he fears you. You've made a hedge around about him and his house and everything every side. You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions. But if you put forth your hand now and touch everything he has, he will surely curse you and to, to your face. You know what he was saying? Let me tell you why he worships you and serves you. You know, if God would have wanted to make a different point in the book of Job, he could have put a stop to it right there and just said, Satan, let me ask you a question. How do you know that that's Job's motive in serving me? How do you know that? Well, there's no way he could have known it. We don't know other people's motives. We can judge actions when we start judging, well, this person did it wrong and this is why they did it. Well, unless they told you why, we don't know. Folks, let me tell you something about motives. They are very, very difficult things to handle. And let me be perfectly honest with you. Half the time, I can't figure out what my own motives are, much less figure out what somebody else's motives were. When we are called upon to judge, we are not to judge presumptuously, and we're not to do it without warrant, without some kind of, you know, if you say a certain thing is wrong, you have to say there's a standard I'm using to judge that it's right and wrong. And that standard has to be the Word of God. And so what we have to make sure is we're not judging somebody on something that the Bible didn't speak to. You see, sometimes we call things morally wrong simply because we don't like them, not because they're really morally wrong. You see, we have to have a standard that we go by, and that standard has to be the Bible. You know, I remember when I was a kid... Uh, I, and I heard two or three people say this. It may be something you don't hear much anymore. I think it's one of those kind of things popular at a time. But uh, this man, certain man, his wife had passed away. And about five months later, he was married again. Okay? And I remember hearing my aunt say, that's wrong. That is wrong. You know, th this woman, his wife wasn't even cold in the grave. And he's married somebody else. Now, folks, let me tell you right up front. I don't think that's a good idea either, you know. I, I don't, I, you know, I, I just don't, there's a lot of, I just don't think that's a good idea. But notice I didn't say it's morally wrong. And the reason is because I don't have any scripture to back that up with. That's just my opinion. And you see, if I still insist that it's immoral, you know in practice what I'm doing? I'm saying, God, you didn't put some stuff in the Bible that should have been in here, you know. Your word's not sufficient. You should have put something in here about how long a person's supposed to wait before they get married. You didn't do it right. It's not, the, the scripture is right. We are not to, to judge without biblical warrant. And then, folks, we're not supposed to judge selectively. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, folks, by human nature... <laughs> we tend to judge pretty harshly those sins that we're not really committing. And we tend to go pretty easy with the ones that we're more liable to commit. See? That's why if you look at that, that story of the prodigal son, you know, it begins by saying a man had two sons. 
the story's not over till he's dealt with two sons, okay? And you get that one son, oh, mercy. He, he takes what was going to be his, he goes out and he spends it in riotous living. He just has a ball. No telling what all kinds of things he was involved in. And buddy, when he ran out of money, he said, you know, the servants in my father's house eat better than I do. I'm going to arise and go to my father. And I'm going to say to him, I've sinned against heaven and before you, would you just make me as one of your hired servants? Folks, let me show you what he did. He repented. He turned around. That's what repentance was. He didn't go living and live the same way that he always was and tell daddy, send more money. Okay? He repented. He turned around. He went home, and his father received him the same way our father receives us when we repent. And you know, a lot of people look at that and say, that's a great story. <laughs> you know? And Jesus says, I'm not finished yet. I said there were two sons. There's another son out here that I've got to go talk to and let him know his brother has come home. And he does, and his brother will not come in and share the feast with this brother. You know why? Because of his pride, his lack of his humility, his bitterness, his lack of love. Folks, that's a whole different kind of set of sins than the other one had. But I'll tell you, both of them kept him out of their father's presence. And it's not going to be until there's repentance. of There's that tendency. Now, folks, the fact is, it, that's true of all of us. We have to be, I was sharing with my class the other day. If somebody came up to me and said, look, I have got some of the absolute purest cocaine that you can buy. And you can come over to my house tonight and we'll have a good time. Folks, do you, do you realize how little of a temptation that would be to me? I, you know, it wouldn't even start. It couldn't get a toehold. And so it's easy for me to stand up and condemn those kinds of sins. And folks, they're sins. Don't get me wrong, they're sins. But it's easy for me to condemn those. And there are other things the person could have invited me to do, and they're none of your business what they are. <laughs> and it could have been a serious temptation for me. But you know what? Both of them are sins. And it's a lot easier for me to judge those sins that I'm not really bad about committing and leaving alone those little pet sins that I have. Right. Now, folks, that doesn't mean we're not supposed to judge. It means we're not supposed to judge wrong. Right. These things are still wrong. Now, so what do we know? We know what Jesus didn't mean. We know what he did mean. But what I love here is how he gives us some incentive here to be obedient, to judge rightly. He gives us some encouragement to do it the way he does. You know, if you, uh, if you look at uh, verse 2, it says, look, the same standard's going to be applied to you. The same standard by which you judge. Folks, now listen, I think I can speak for all of us here. I generally don't do that, but I think, I think I'm pretty safe here. When we stand before God, we're going to need a lot of grace and mercy. And that means when we do and are called upon to judge what people are doing, it needs to have grace and mercy along with it. Okay? He says it's going to be measured out to you the same way. The scripture says all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, folks, that means you're going to be judged in that day, and I'm going to be judged in that day. Now, please understand, it's not going to be judging to determine where you're going to heaven or hell. Okay? God's going to do that in a different judgment. Okay? Uh, if you are a believer in Jesus, you have repented of your sins and put your trust in him. Let me tell you what God has said to you when he's looked at all of your sins and enumerated those sins and you feel so guilty and the devil's telling you you're guilty. God said, not guilty. Not guilty. 
Folks, that's what we mean by God's forgiveness, declares us not guilty. That, that's not what, you, if you're a child of God, that's been, what, what you heard when he saved you is a foreshadow of what you're going to hear in that last day when your sins are enumerated and God says, not guilty. And the reason he's going to say not guilty is he looks at your sins and he looks at you and he looks at Jesus and he looks at his atonement and he looks back to you and says, not guilty. Now, that's wonderful. But the Bible does say that all of us are going to give an account of ourselves unto God. You know, uh, folks, we're going to give an account for our sins, and we're going to have to give an account for how we judged other people. And we need to keep that in mind. You know, if we do that, I think it'll help us treat people more lovingly and gently. You know, I don't teach senior seminar much anymore. I used to teach it a lot. It's set up a little bit differently than most courses. And students come in and turn in a paper one day, their paper's due, and the next day, the students have read their paper and they've made all kinds of corrections on it, and then we discuss it in class. You have to go through class and have students point out. You know what I noticed through the years is every time we were doing it, everybody's jumping, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, and there was always one person that never joined in. And it wasn't the same person every time. What I did find out, it was always the person who was up next. Okay. <laughs> And, and they knew they were up next, and so they were going real easy on the person before them. Uh, folks, that's, that's what our tendency is to do, and that's what we need to be real careful about. We need to make sure that when we do have to judge, and folks, if we're going to be salt and light in this world, we're going to have to do that. We're going to have to make sure that we do it with some gentleness. That same standard's going to be applied to us. Folks, let, let me... This thing about judging. Um, Paul, speaking to the church at, at, at Ephesus, said this. Speaking the truth in love. Now, he meant both of those. Now, here's the problem. Folks, we have different personalities. So we're just, different, we're just cut, cut out differently. There are some people that by nature, they can speak the truth without much trouble. Okay? They'll tell you in a second. They don't care if it costs a friendship. It costs them their job. It, it doesn't matter. They'll tell you in a second, you are wrong. That is immoral what you're doing. They can do it. That's just, they, they're just sort of built more in that direction. <laughs> now, there's, folks, there's others of us that are sort of in the other direction. We think, well, you know, I, I love people too much to say that kind of thing to them. <laughs> you know, well, folks, that's just as bad. You know, he says, actually, speak the truth in love we actually haven't done what the scripture says to do unless we've done both unless we have actually told the truth but they, we have done it in love speak the truth in love folks we are to speak the truth you know again somebody said well I, I i just love the person too much listen the person who loves you is the one who tells you the truth please don't ever forget that and if you love somebody, you tell them the truth. Now, my mother passed away about 15 years ago. I learned a lot from my mother. I am so thankful for her. There are so many things that she said that reverberate my, that I'm saying, man, my mother taught me. That is just, I'm so, but you know, my mother said one thing that I can't believe she said. She taught me this. And I ended up saying, you've got to be kidding me, you know. My mother, my own mother, a great, wonderful woman taught me that. Great Christian woman. You know what she said to me? You're not going to believe it. She said, if you can't say something nice, don't say it. <laughs> my mother told me that. I said, you can't, you know. I can just see her walking with Jesus and Jesus condemning certain things and her saying, now Jesus, hey, <laughs> that's not nice. You be Nice. Friends, let me tell you something. Read the Gospels fairly carefully, and you might find out Jesus wasn't nearly as nice as you thought he was. He never sacrificed the truth in order to make friends. In fact, if he would have done that, they wouldn't have put him on the cross. That's why he went to the cross. He insisted on telling the truth. But friends, listen. That same Jesus who insisted on telling the truth when he rode into Jerusalem the last time, 
knowing what was going to happen, that he was going to be crucified, the scripture says that he looked out on that city and he wept with compassion. Because you know what? The world would look at us as Christians a lot different when we judged if they would see tears in our eyes in the process of it. That they would understand that it was because we love that we speak the truth, we speak it in love. So what's Jesus telling us here? He's not telling us, don't ever judge. Well, you can't even make any sense of the verses that follow after that if you say he's meaning we never judge. Do not let Satan silence you and prevent you from being light in a dark world and salt in a world that needs that salt. Let's don't let Satan rob us of that opportunity and, and privilege and responsibility to represent God in the world. But friends, at the same time, let, let's have a full-blown, robust picture of what all this means. It means we are to be people of compassion, people of love, and that people see us. And when we do have to speak the truth firmly, it's clear to everybody that we're reflecting the same love that Jesus had to people that he ultimately had to condemn what they were doing. May God help us here. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you speak clearly to us in your word. And Lord, when we look at passages like this, we really do see where we have fallen short. Lord, there are times we need to confess that we've been wishy-washy. Lord, that we haven't stood firm. And Father, we ask your forgiveness for that. Father, we realize there are times when we have spoken and there was no sign of any love and compassion in our voice. Lord, we ask that you'd forgive us of that. Father, I pray that you would help us to give us a love for the truth. You've told us that you were the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, we are to reflect you. Lord, help us to do that and forgive us where we failed. And Lord, help us to be people of compassion. Your word says, having compassion, making a difference. Lord, we want to make a difference by being people of compassion, even in the very presence of people of whom we disagree with what they're doing. And Lord, thank you for choosing in your own self to be compassionate toward us. That while we, we were yet sinners, you loved us and gave yourself for us. Lord, for that, we're eternally grateful. Bless us as we go on through the day. May we honor you in all that we do because you are worthy. In Christ's name, amen.